Hi everybody, we're, we're the, the Wiggles. Wiggles. Toot toot, chugga chugga, big red car. Hot potato, hot potato. Hot potato, hot potato. Greg, I know that the Wiggles have always been about the children, but as a mother, I need to tell you and say thank you for the respite that you provided for parents around the world. <laughs> you put some Wiggles on, put the music on, video, whatever, dancing in the lounge room. It was such a gift. But you started out doing kindergartens and kids' birthday, <laughs> birthday parties. Is yeah. this true? It is true. Yeah, that's how we started. I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny when you think back and reflect on how it began. We used to charge, say, $500 for the Wiggles to play for you. So somebody booked us, but they sold tickets to that show. And they sold like 500 tickets at $5 a head. And we thought, well, hang on, why are we charging $500? That's when we realised that people are paying to come and see us. So that was really a pinch me moment where we thought, hang on, this could be something bigger than we ever thought it could be. And now, of course, so many generations of kids have grown up and you do these adult gigs, how amazing. It is, it's incredible. We're very fortunate that as old, older gentlemen, <laughs> we're able to still get on stage and perform for the people that grew up watching us. And it's such a trip down memory lane for them, but also for us too. And we have such a good time on stage, the four of us. It brings back a lot of good memories. We need your help to sing it because we don't have, we can just go home. They know it. The Wiggles reunion shows are a nostalgia fueled delight for Greg Page and his now grown up fan base. But it was at one of these concerts four years ago that the original Yellow Wiggle came frighteningly close to losing his life. You know, it was a hot night and, you know, the heat's not conducive when you're exerting yourself on stage. And there'd been times in the past when, because it is such a physically demanding show, that I would kind of collapse at the side of the stage and nothing would be too wrong, but this time it was different. There was something majorly wrong. Thank you, everybody! Woo! Oh. So what had happened was I suffered a heart attack, which is different to a cardiac arrest, but the heart attack was so severe that it sent my heart into cardiac arrest. Um, guys, we, I think we're going to end it there. Greg's not feeling real well. He's... Um... I think he's going to be okay, but um, uh, he's not feeling real well, so I don't think we can go on with another song. Someone who's having a heart attack, their heart is still beating, it's still pumping blood around their body, right? But for cardiac arrest, there's no blood pumping around your body. You are effectively clinically dead. But there's a window of time in which that person can be resuscitated if bystanders know what to do. When you realised how close you had come to not surviving. How did that make you feel? Um, that's an interesting question because actually I, sometimes I, I think I don't really acknowledge that, how close I came. Um, yeah, I don't really reflect on that too much, to be honest. I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate that when it happened, it was so quick, like I literally blacked out within seconds. For a lot of people that have a heart attack that leads to a cardiac arrest, they have that moment of thinking, oh my gosh, what's happening? I never had that. It just happened so quickly that it was over. To wake up in hospital and be told that you've survived, you're not really sure what you've survived, to be honest. You know that you might not have survived if it hadn't been for other people that were able to save your life. But yeah, because I wasn't aware of what was happening at the time, I think it's something that's kind of almost beyond my comprehension. While it's difficult for Greg to process the full scale of what he went through, not a day goes by where he doesn't think about the four bystanders who came to his aid backstage. After surviving, I realised I knew very little about this, even though my wife's a cardiac nurse, right? <laughs> so I thought, well, why is that? And I realised that cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest is one of the biggest killers in our country. It's a critical national health issue, but it's one that flies under the radar. It's not spoken about. We talk about heart disease and looking after our heart, but we don't talk about what everyday people can do if somebody collapses in front of them, either at work or at home, at the shops, at the park. I think a lot of people like myself, I thought you had to be trained in order to do CPR, whereas now I know you don't. Any attempt at resuscitation is better than no attempt. You don't have to be trained or qualified. So knowing that, helps people get beyond that freeze point of, well, I shouldn't do anything. Hands on the chest and we start to compress. Keep the beat, keep the beat going. Greg
Blake's close call inspired him to start up Heart of the Nation, a charity dedicated to improving Aussies' awareness of how to respond to cardiac arrests. And he's particularly passionate about one vital piece of technology. So this is the little machine that saved your life? Yep. This is an AED, Automated External Defibrillator. No matter what brand or model it is, they all work in pretty much the same way. So if it's not talking to you, work out how to get it talking to you. Either turn it on using a power button or some of them have a lid that you open up. So you just press the power button or open it up, get it talking, and it tells you what to do. It becomes the team leader. So there was one of those at the venue? Yeah, it was available for my responders. So the fact that they were able to call triple zero, start CPR and have access rapidly to an AED, they're the three kind of links in what we call the chain of survival that saved my life. Just call for help, start CPR and use an AED. So you would like to see an AED readily accessible wherever we are in the community? I'd love to see What that. does that look like? Well, what it looks like is one in every building, one on every floor of a building, because if you have one of these within three minutes of somebody, so from collapse to being shocked with an AED within three to five minutes can result in survival rates as high as 60 to 70 per cent. Right, we're not talking 10%. So rapid access in public buildings, in residences, in streets, they need to be everywhere. So does that come down to funding? I mean, how expensive are they? Look, they're not that expensive in the scheme of things. They're a couple of thousand dollars, right? Between two and three thousand dollars. But when they save a life, that's immeasurable. So they are extremely valuable. Having them close by means that more people will survive. So what I'd love to see happen is that the government actually says, we will help fund this because every life that is lost costs the economy. And I hate to put it in economic terms, but unfortunately, that's the way politicians tend to think, right? What is this gonna cost and what is gonna be the benefit? For every life that is lost from sudden cardiac arrest, it's equivalent to about $2.2 million from our economic productivity that we lose, right? And when you're talking about nearly 30,000 people a year dying from cardiac arrest, it's a lot of people. So we have gotta try and save more lives. I can see how passionate you are about this, Greg. Yeah, look, I, I, obviously, there's a, a reason why, right? And unfortunately, until your life is affected by something and you don't know about it up until that point, when you're enlightened about it, you think everybody needs to know this because the more people that know and understand about it, the more lives we're going to save. And that's what we can do together because we're sharing the message. <laughs> <laughs>